Again, welcome, welcome, and uh, we're glad that you're here. We, I know we have several uh, who are visiting with us tonight, so we appreciate that. Um, <laughs> in just a few minutes, we'll, we'll dismiss the young ones downstairs, and uh, then we'll commence with our class up here. And this is a uh, class that I had prepared for, for my uh, smaller class upstairs, and we're just going to all look at it tonight. You'll have to endure it, I guess, also. So, uh, But we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, if you would, turn in your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to be talking about uh, myths and legends. And during this time of the year, you know, there are a lot of uh, myths and, and legends and ideas that people like to talk about or pass around uh, that I want to encourage you to go back to the scriptures and, and check the things that maybe you've heard or maybe the tr traditions that have been passed on that you check with the scriptures because we want to be people of the book and go back to the Bible and, and try to live our lives according to the truth rather than any uh, ideas of men. And uh, <clears throat> I, I was watching on the History Channel the other day. They have a lot of specials on right now about Jesus. And I'd encourage you to watch them, but watch them with your Bible open. And uh, they're very interesting. Darcy and I watched one about the last 40 days uh, that Jesus was on the earth, the 40 days after his resurrection. And it was very interesting. Uh, but, you know, one of the guys who was the... Uh, uh, the commentator, the one leading the talk about it, uh, was Bart Ehrman. He's the agnostic who Kyle Butt just debated uh, just not too long ago up at UNA. And so uh, these are the kind of people who they're using to to teach about the Bible who don't even have any faith in the Bible. And so uh, uh, when you watch some of those shows, I encourage you, get your Bible out and check the things that are being said according to what the Bible actually teaches and, uh, and follow along with that. Uh, that's actually where my class that I was going to do upstairs, which I'm going to do downstairs now, uh, came from. I had some in class who asked questions. They said, well, well what about this? Where do these things come from? And so that's what we're going to cover, and we'll do that in just a few minutes. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, though, it tells us in verse 6, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it's written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit which is in him? So no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. These things we speak. He says, these things we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but words which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Here, Paul, is, he is inspired, as he says, by the Holy Spirit. He is giving us the words that God has given. If anyone ever discusses or, or considers inspiration and how inspiration works, here's the answer right here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, God gave me the very words. The words that we read in the Bible can be trusted because they're the very words of God. These are the words that God has made known uh, to uh, his people, his men here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that they might write them down, that they might speak them, that we might then be able to read them and have the very words of God ourselves. Themselves. You know, over in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And then it says in verse 17, That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Over in uh, 2 uh, Peter 1, uh, in verse 3, it tells us that he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness in the Word. And so that's my encouragement to you tonight, is to go to the Word, go to the Bible, and listen to what God has to say uh, about the things that you might hear on TV or, or in conversations with friends. Go to the Bible and make sure that we stand for what the Bible teaches uh, above any traditions or any myths and legends that mankind has come up with. Uh, that's my encouragement to you tonight. There may be someone here tonight who has been studying their Bible and has decided that they want to follow Jesus, that they want to put away the, the, the sins of their past and that they want to uh, rid themselves of the guilt that has plagued them because of the sin in the past. And we want to encourage you to leave that behind and to uh, make Jesus your Lord and Savior by obedience to his gospel uh, by recognizing who he truly is and allowing him then to lead you through his word as he will teach you all the words of God and guide you into uh, a, 
a righteous life, a life that can make a difference in the world around you. If you need to obey the gospel, we encourage you to do that tonight. And Maybe you just need to make things right with God and with your church family. If you can do it from where you're sitting, then by all means do that. If it's something that needs to be confessed to all of us and, and encouragement needs to be given uh, publicly, then let that be known. And let's pray together and, and for one another and encourage one another in our faith. Whatever your need is, won't you come while we stand and we sing this song? Follow Jesus. Back, no turning back, though none go with me, I follow. The known go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Decide now to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. They're back. Thank you. All right, um, the questions had been asked of me in, in that class, and, and rather than doing them on a Sunday, one of our question and answers Sunday nights, I figured I would handle it just in our class. And so that's what this uh, lesson is. And I thought when uh, the decision was made kind of late uh, tonight to just keep everyone in here that I would just go ahead and present it to all of you. And uh, so we're going to look at some things that maybe you didn't know about uh, the tradition uh, of Christmas and uh, some of the things that uh, have been uh, taught or, or thought, I guess, in the past about Christmas and uh, compare uh, a couple things to uh, what the scriptures say. And then and there's some other things that are just, um, um, I, I guess, outside of, of that. Uh, we're going to also, someone had asked about Hanukkah. And uh, so we're going to Talk about Hanukkah, because I'm sure that's, everyone has seen Hanukkah or heard Happy Hanukkah at times, and so, and it is a very interesting story, actually, and uh, one that I've enjoyed reading in the past, and uh, I've done a couple of papers on in college, and so it is interesting, so I'll tell you a little bit about that also. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as we get started, let's see, we're going to start over in Luke chapter 2, if this works. It's not going to work, you're going to have to click me. There we go. Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, oh, before I get into that, I had some things, uh, um, some questions. <clears throat> Let's just see if uh, we know some of these. There's some questions about this, and uh, um, I guess some ideas about what happened at the birth of Christ that have uh, crept in to our minds as if that they are, are part of what the Scriptures teach, but maybe not necessarily. So I've got some questions for you. Who told Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem? Anybody? Who told them to go to Bethlehem in the first place? What? <laughs> Who? Augustus, that's right, Caesar. Um, oh, you got it up there on the top. He, com he, com he commanded a census, that's right. That's why they're going. All right, um, true or false, Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem for the birth of Jesus because they were following a star. False. They went there for the census. Absolutely. Um, and how, uh, what kind of transportation did Mary and Joseph use to get to Bethlehem? What? We don't know. That's right. All we know is Buck and George. That's right. We don't really know. Uh, most of the artwork that you see about it has uh, Mary on a donkey uh, traveling that distance. But we don't know. We don't know if they, if they used a donkey or not. Who knows? Um, how many uh, wise men were there? There's three gifts, yeah, three gifts, but we don't know exactly how many, how many wise men there were. It says men, so it had to be more than one, right? <laughs> We'd expect more than two, but we don't know exactly how many there were. 
Um, what are the meanings of the names Jesus and Emmanuel? I, I talked about Jesus uh, this past Sunday. God with us is Emmanuel. And what does Jesus mean? Savior. It means Savior, absolutely. Um, the shepherds, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, the shepherds and the wise men went to see Jesus. Which group followed a star and which group went to find the baby because the angels told them where to look? Angel told the shepherds. The wise men followed a star. That's right. Um, let's see. Um, in Matthew 2 and verse 8, it says that Herod asked the wise men to inform him where the baby Jesus was and why does this verse say that he wanted to know where baby, the baby Jesus was? All right. He said that so that he could worship uh, the child, but then we find out in verses 11 through 18 that they had a different intention, didn't he? What was that? To kill him, okay, to get rid of him. He didn't want any competition for that physical throne that he enjoyed. And uh, yet we know that Jesus was, uh, came to establish a spiritual kingdom. Well, in Luke chapter 2, um, those, basically those ideas and those things are set forward. Let me get over there. Luke chapter 2. And uh, <clears throat> if you will, you can follow along with me. Train. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this census took place uh, while Cornelius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And so here we have the introduction, I guess, and the, the, the beginning of uh, Jesus' mission here on the earth with us uh, to, uh, to come to us as his name uh, teaches us, Emmanuel, God with us. He's born in a manger. Uh, of course, then the announcement comes. Uh, in verse 8, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring to you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known, that's a key scripture, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child, and that would be that he is the Christ. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, as it was told them. You know, we were just talking uh, about in the, in the devotional message about going back to the Word and listening to what the Word says. And here, this is, this is what's going on. They go back to what was inspired. What was it that the angels said to them by command of God? And it says, not only did the, the, the shepherds continue to contemplate that and to consider what the angels had told them, the message from God, but also Mary pondered it and kept it in her heart. She treasured these things up, you know, remembering what was said about this, uh, this child who she had just given birth to, who she knew uh, because of the prophecy and what had been told to her, that he was the Savior of, uh, of the people, of all people. Um, and I think it's very interesting that the, uh, that the Lord brought the angels to the shepherds. Um, <laughs> that was good timing. Um, the, the angels announce it to shepherds. If they came today, it would be like they would come to, you know, construction workers or, or uh, uh, I don't know, uh, some plumbers or something like that. Some regular guys, you know, just regular guys doing their job as they were doing them. They didn't go to uh, the king. They didn't go to Caesar. 
You know, they didn't go to the, to the mightiest and the most powerful, the wealthiest. They just went to some regular people. And those were the people who then took that message forward, you know, and, and told other people. Today in, in America, we like to call that a grassroots movement, right? And uh, that's exactly how it started, how things uh, began with Jesus Christ. And these people uh, remembered these things. I think sometimes as we get into the life of Christ and we see such huge crowds following him, of course, some of them were there because of the miracles that he did. I would say most of them were there for that. But there had to have been some who remembered this. You know, some who were still alive, who recognized and remembered, this is the man. This is the one who was born, who uh, we had an announcement made by angels who had this star over uh, where he was born, who uh, many came from uh, so far away to uh, give him praise and glory. All right, so let's look at a couple of myths. Why December 25th? Um, like I said, these are some, some specific questions that, that have been asked of me, and so we're going to look at each one of these. Uh, the Romans celebrated the uh, win- winter solstice. They celebrated this uh, change in time as the days start to get uh, longer again. And it was a time of worship for the sun, okay, to actually worship the sun. And, and sometimes it's referenced as the sun god, but, but truly they're worshiping the actual sun, uh, the, uh, the thing that shines in the sky. And so that was what they were there to worship. And they did this on December 25th. This was the day. And so uh, Emperor, uh, Roman Emperor Constantine, uh, he decided because he had uh, uh, decided that he believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah, and that this was the truth. Uh, he had made that commitment, and so he decreed that instead of celebrating and worshiping the Son, that all people under his control, under his reign, would now worship Jesus and recognize that Jesus was the Son of God, and that that would be the day that they would consider him to have been born. Now, um, we know, and he also knew, that that was not the day that Jesus was born. Uh, almost any, any Bible scholar or anyone who considers scriptures recognizes uh, that it was probably in the springtime. I think everyone recognizes that and understands that. But uh, to trump what had been going on and to change the people's mindset from following after pagan gods to following after the true God, This is what the Emperor Constantine did. It happened in 336 A.D. So you have to remember, this is not far removed from uh, those who were following Christ and and those who um, had helped in being inspired in writing these scriptures and and giving them to us just a few hundred years separated uh, from these people doing this. So uh, that's why it's on December 25th, if you've ever wondered why December 25th. And uh, we'll get into a a little bit more information in a minute about December 6th and a significant Uh, date uh, that that it has with it and and kind of the merger of that December 25th celebration and the December 6th celebration that happened uh, not too uh, well actually a little bit before this was made official Um, okay when was Jesus born now uh, this is another problem Um, if you watch if you've seen Duck Dynasty lately uh, Phil likes to reference the fact that uh, time was split by by Jesus Christ you know and everything before him is before Christ BC and everything after him is is AD after death and um, but that's not necessarily true Um, what happened was uh, Dionysus was the guy who was picked uh, by the government to fix the calendar and to figure out exactly when uh, Jesus was born and to, to change everything and, and to make the calendar a uh, standard calendar for all the human race. And so he worked on this, and he worked on it around 525 A.D. He calculated, based on what he had, the knowledge that he had at the time, uh, the best that he possibly could have known, and when he calculated it, he got it wrong. He missed it by several years. Probably, uh, Jesus was actually probably born between 4 B.C. or 5 B.C. And so he was born four or five years before himself, but uh, according to the, the calendar. But that's, that's the way that the guy who was in charge of doing it did it, and so we're stuck with it. So we're, we, uh, we still operate on that calendar that he came up with, the uh, Roman calendar, and uh, that's what we have to this day. But, yeah, he got it wrong. Um, it was not actually the year number one. And so, uh, and we know this uh, as Christians, we can go and look in Matthew 2 and verse 15 and read about Herod's death. And we know how that uh, uh, Joseph and Mary had taken the, the baby and escaped down to Egypt because Herod had sent out a decree to kill all the children two years old and down, the murder of the innocents. Uh, he wanted to try to get rid of Jesus that way. And uh, we know that after he died is when the family came back to, uh, to Judea. And so 
uh, when he died, uh, we recognize based on his death in 4 BC, Jesus had to have already been born and, uh, because uh, that's what the Bible says. And so when you compare it with what the scriptures say, the calendar must be wrong. And, uh, and then you find out it actually is. All right, another question. This one's a fun one. I really liked this one. Why Christmas trees? Why do we have, and that's why I have Christmas trees on my slides. Why Christmas trees? All right, <clears throat> this is a very interesting story. Um, this uh, happened really early. Let me look on my notes and remember, this is, uh, uh, this is somewhere around uh, the uh, 400s, okay? So really early in, uh, in, uh, Christianity, Christian history, okay? And when I'm speaking of Christianity, at this point in time, yes, the Christianity had become extremely splintered. There was a lot of different uh, factions, a lot of different groups had, had come off. Of course, the, uh, what we refer to now as the Catholic Church had become the, the largest uh, group and had a, a considerable amount of influence on governments. And so, uh, and, and they were very active in sending out missionaries. Now, uh, we know that the scriptures teach us that there is always a remnant, that there was always a group of Christians who would always be faithful. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, God said the same thing. And so I believe, and, uh, and I think the Bible bears out, there's obviously some people who are following the truth and doing exactly what God would have them to do. But there's other groups and bigger groups doing a lot of different things. We read about the, uh, uh, the Gnostics in uh, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John towards the end of the uh, inspired record. And uh, John calls them out, you know, and, and basically compares them to the Antichrist, saying that uh, Jesus didn't come in the flesh. They believed anything that had flesh had to be defiled and evil and sinful. And so Jesus being holy and perfect um, must have appeared to be in the flesh, but not actually in the flesh, which is a false idea because the Bible teaches that he was in the flesh and that he did take on uh, a human form and that he faced all the same exact things that we face in this life. And uh, to take that away from who Jesus is is to violate scripture. And so we, we don't do that and we recognize them as, as false teachers because that's exactly what uh, John calls them as an apostle of the Lord. And so that's one group who had considerable influence in the world at the time. Uh, you have several other different big groups. But Christmas trees, they come about uh, in northern Germany. There were um, trees that were linked to pagan gods, okay? And uh, different trees held different significance for different uh, false gods. And uh, the oak tree, the biggest and strongest tree in northern uh, Germany, was associated with the, uh, the god Thor, okay? He's the one in the Avengers movies, you know, and uh, he's popular right now again. And uh, uh, Thor, and uh, the, the, this specific little village where uh, a, a preacher named Boniface went, he gets there, and they have this huge tree in the middle, and uh, this is Thor's tree. And uh, the legend was that if anyone ever tried tried to cut that tree down, then uh, Thor would strike them dead immediately. And so uh, he gets there, and he's trying to tell them about Jesus. They don't care about Jesus. They don't want to hear about Jesus. All they care about is Thor. And um, they have Thor pep rallies, and they're, you know, they're just all about Thor. They wear the costumes and the underoos and all that. They're into Thor. And, uh, but he's trying to tell them that Thor is not true, that he's, that he's a false god. And uh, one night, in the middle of the night, Boniface decides... Um, He's going to chop down the tree, and uh, he does, and it takes him all night long, and the people hear him, and they go out there, and they, they catch him as the tree starts to fall, okay? And uh, instead of killing him, though, all of a sudden, he's this hero, because they're all watching and thinking, lightning sticks in a strike, this guy, he just cut down Thor's tree, you know, something bad fitting to happen to him, nothing happens. Nothing happens to him. And so then he starts telling them about Jesus again. And this time he's got their attention. And they start listening now. And they say, well, what tree, what tree is it that should be associated with it? Because they can't get these trees separated from their gods. They can't separate the idea of a god not having a tree. And so Boniface, there's a, a little fir tree growing close to where Thor's tree was. And he says, okay, this is your new tree. This one represents Jesus. And the sermon that he preaches to them is how that the fir tree uh, points up towards heaven to help them remember and think about uh, God in heaven and that he's looking down on them to, to guide them and to, to help them. And uh, that, that's one thing, the shape of the tree. Also, the fact that most of their homes were built out of the larger fir trees. Uh, and he used that to say, you know, your homes are to be built 
on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And uh, it was a, it's a great sermon that he preaches to them and, and teaches them from this little fir tree uh, that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that he is the only true God. And the people believe him and they uh, uh, obey uh, as he teaches them. And from then on, uh, um, around December 25th, because that tradition had already been started, uh, they would go and get small fir trees and bring them into their homes like they had done before with, with other pagan gods. Uh, and this time they started to apply it to Jesus. And, uh, but they didn't do it exactly the way that we have Christmas trees today. They actually hung them from the ceiling. And so <laughs> their Christmas trees were hung from the ceiling and they did decorate them like uh, is done now, but it was decorated with like their, uh, the things that they would wear, the things that we would consider, you know, like a wedding ring, something as precious as a wedding ring or, or something really precious that we would have, um, not plastic, you know, balls and, and ornaments like that that we colored and stuff. It was the best stuff that they had. But, but that's, that's kind of how the Christmas tree came into being and, uh, and, and where it comes from. Let me make sure I got all my, yeah. That's it. <clears throat> so, pretty interesting story of how we have the Christmas tree. If you have a Christmas tree in your home, there you have the, the origin. Uh, and I'd like to point out, um, a few Sunday nights ago in the questions and answers, we talked about the fact that some, some things change their meaning, you know, and that they don't mean the same thing. We certainly know that words change their meaning, and uh, there would be some who would object to, to uh, having anything to do with, with Christmas because it's based on some things that uh, in the past were associated with false god, like a Christmas tree. It was definitely uh, associated by those in, in that uh, Germanic area as uh, uh, trees were linked to God, like we said, and, uh, and yet we don't link the tree to God at all, um, except for the fact that he's the creator of it and that he's blessed us with every good thing. And so uh, these things uh, uh, have, have changed their meaning. They're not pagan to us, at least in America. We don't even uh, recognize many of those things. We still refer to Thursday as Thursday, which uh, originated and is Thor's day. And so it's dedicated. It's a day dedicated to him. It's called Thursday because of Thor. And we don't object to that. Uh, and we shouldn't. It's, it's fine. We know that Thor is not real. That is, he's not a god. And uh, we know who the one true god is. And so, uh, like we said on, on a couple of Sunday nights ago, when we go to Romans chapter 14, we recognize, you know, there's some things that uh, we can uh, do away with and that we can recognize the true meaning and uh, instead follow what the scriptures say rather than traditions of men or, or what other people might think. All right, so the interesting Christmas tree. Um, all right, who is Santa Claus? Did we get all the little ones out of here? All right, <laughs> we've got a few. Um, this <clears throat> Santa Claus um, comes from a really neat person. Cover all of his ears, yeah? All right, y'all. Um, no, it's not, it doesn't mess up anything. Uh, Santa Claus is based on a, a guy named St. Nick. St. Nick who uh, was a, a wonderful person. And the biggest thing that you find about St. Nick is that he loved people like Jesus. That's what's said about him, okay? Well, when you go back to the, to the old writings in, in uh, 300 AD, that's a long time ago, you know, and they say he loved people like Jesus did. Well, why? Well, St. Nicholas, he was extremely wealthy, more wealthy than pretty much anybody else period, okay, besides the king. And so this is an extremely wealthy guy, and what he does with his wealth is he finds poor people and he gives it away. He gives away as much as he can, and his family still has plenty of money when he dies, okay? <laughs> he gave away everything that he possibly could through his life. Um, some interesting fact about St. Nicholas is uh, pawn shops are uh, the symbol for the pawn shop. I should have put it up there, but you know, it's, it's three gold balls and it's got kind of the, the circle on kind of holding those three. That's all from St. Nicholas, okay? Because he would, he would pawn, he would allow people to pawn things and give them money that they might go and, and, and do whatever they needed and then they could come back and get their things uh, from him when they, when they paid him back. And uh, the, the story goes that, you know, most of them didn't ever actually even pay him back, but their stuff would just show up at, the, at their houses and they would have it back again uh, because he was just that, that wonderful of a guy and, and that giving um, of a fella. So you've got uh, St. Nick, and uh, this is around 300 AD. A, a really, really wonderful story about him is that there were three sisters, three sisters who, whose father was on his deathbed, and at this time in history, uh, without any brothers to take care of them and without any money to give a dowry for, for a, a young man to marry them, uh, there was going to be no marriage. And what would happen is, just like their father's 
uh, furniture and, and other possessions, they would be sold as slaves um, because there was no one to, to take them and to, to care for them. So they would be sold as slaves. Well, uh, St. Nicholas decided that that was not going to happen. And he went to their home and uh, uh, they actually had their socks hung on the mantle by their fireplace to dry because, you know, they had like one pair of socks each and they were wet. And so he went there and he actually put the money in their socks hanging from the mantle and uh, gave them so much gold that they didn't have to be sold into slavery. And they were self-sufficient. They were able to even get married and all uh, live wonderful, happy lives. Uh, but it was all because of him. And uh, the pawn shop, three, the three gold balls, I guess, on the pawn shop symbol is based on those three sisters and the gold that he gave to those three that became the symbol for uh, St. Nicholas and everyone who gave and who helped people that way, that was the symbol that they would hang outside their stores. Oh, that was pretty interesting. Uh, but it's all based on St. Nicholas. He saved those sisters from slavery and the date for that was December 6th. And so on December 6th throughout Europe and it spread and grew and got bigger and bigger um, through the years, um, the children would hang their socks usually by their windows um, and then it kind of some would be by their mantle if they had their you know at their fireplaces and and uh, but different places they would hang their stock, stockings or their their socks and uh, their parents if they were wealthy enough would give them um, things in their stockings St. Nicholas was known for not only giving gold but he would give oranges that was the other thing so have you ever gotten an orange in your stocking on Christmas well, that's where it came from. He actually gave oranges. And so, <laughs> and so pretty interesting uh, stuff that this was a, a real person. And I think that the, the really the, the best thing about that we learn about him is the fact that the record about this guy and what's known about him is... This is a guy who, now this is not what it says on Wikipedia about St. Nicholas, but uh, this is what it says in the, the writings of theologians from the time, that it was a man who loved like Jesus. And I thought that was a, a beautiful way to describe someone who gave, who gave everything that he had. Um, in, in, in Dutch, they referred to St. Nick as Sinterklaas, and in German, he was called St. Nicholas. And uh, in America then, as those two uh, groups mixed together after they got over here, that's where we got the name Santa Claus, uh, was kind of a mixture of those two names. And um, the U.S., of course, um, the, the Christmas holiday grew so strong. We had, uh, even into the, the 1900s, the television and the radio that was put out about him uh, basically overrode all the other ideas of who he was in all the other countries of the world. And basically, it's a um, a United States version of Santa Claus that's all over the world now and that everyone recognizes uh, the one who dresses in the red and the white and, and uh, the image that we have of Santa Claus is, has basically gone viral. It's gone all over the world and that's who everyone refers to. And in the United States, um, <clears throat> because the United States put them together, the December 6th celebration of St. Nick and the 20. December 25th celebration of, of the birth uh, of Christ, or the idea that that was the, birth, the day of the birth of Christ. We mix those together in America, and that's now how it's kind of become mainstream all around the world. That December 25th is both St. Nicholas Day, uh, celebrating a guy who loved people like Jesus, and uh, December 25th, uh, which is a celebration of the uh, coming of Jesus according to uh, the tradition of men. All right, and we've got one more. What about Hanukkah? I can't overemphasize how interesting Hanukkah. If you like war stories, and I love war stories, um, if you like war stories, then go and read about the Maccabees, okay? Because they're extremely interesting. What they did, uh, they, it's five brothers, and uh, this is during the, the time of silence in your Bible, the, the period in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. You got about 400 years there. And what happens in that time is actually recorded in a book. Now, it's not inspired, of course, by God, but it is... Uh, a very, uh, seems very accurate when you compare it to other uh, pieces of literature from the time given by the Romans and by the Greeks. But here we have um, a group of men, five brothers named Maccabees. Their last name is Maccabees. And uh, this happens during the, and I never say this name right, but Seleucid Empire. And this is an empire that's based in Syria, but it's not Syrians, okay? It's Greeks. And, and it's uh, the, the guy... Ant I can't say his name either, Antichus IV Epiphanes. And what if, what if we did that, Trey III Durden or something? Yeah, we had 
or middle, uh, anyway, his, his name is Antiochus, Anti, 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 I can't say it, Epiphanes, <laughs> number four, and uh, he is one of the generals of Alexander the Great's army, okay, and what Alexander the Great did when he died, he gave all his generals different areas, and this guy, number four, ends up in Syria ruling the whole area around there, um, part of which includes Israel. And so, um, and, and Jerusalem. And so in Jerusalem, you have uh, the Jews who are there and they rebelled under the leadership of these uh, Maccabees brothers who, uh, <clears throat> who were just really, really neat uh, people and uh, the way that they chose to, to kind of incite their rebellion and come about it. it, it it's, it's really familiar um, to American patriotism and the, the history that you read about in our history books because of the way that they they raised, uh, got the people raised up to, to fight against uh, Anta, Antichus, I can't say his name, Epiphanes. Um, he hated Israel. He hated Israel. He hated uh, the religion of, of the Jews. And uh, what he did was he went down to Jerusalem. And the first thing that he did was he marched into the temple. He killed every priest that he found. He marched into the temple then. And he tore down all of the, uh, the things that were uh, put there by God and that we learn about in the scriptures that were supposed to be there. And he erected a statue of Zeus. For them to, and told them that was who that they should worship from now on. And then, just to be extra insulting to them, he, uh, he sacrificed a pig on the altar, okay? Which we know, you know, pigs were forbidden from the, from the Jewish people to eat uh, during the Old Testament. So he's just insulting them as much as he can. He instructs his uh, soldiers to continue to sacrifice pigs on the altar in the viewing of all the people and force the people to walk by, you know, and so they're all coming by. They're not even supposed to be around this, you know, this animal, number one. Uh, it's totally unclean. Uh, number two, this animal is on one of the holy, uh, what they, you know, is holy and sanctified for God uh, in their temple, and so they're forced to see it. They're forced to participate in it, and uh, many of them choose death rather than uh, participate in this, and this is what rallies the Maccabee brothers and, and all the other uh, Jewish people at the time. And so uh, they rebel, and it's an am amazing uh, uh, kind of a David and Goliath story. Uh, these the small group going against this uh, extremely powerful king, and they win. They push them out. Not only do they push them out, uh, they they conquer a lot of area uh, other than there. And uh, of course, they attribute all of this to God being with them and and God helping them. There is a uh, when you when you hear about Hanukkah now, um, you know that there's a I should have put a picture of it up there. Sorry, but there's a candle. What's that called? Yeah, menorah. Um, the candle just has eight. Um, places for candles on it. And what that stands for is uh, during the time that they were re, you know, cleaning up the temple and getting all the, the stain of the pig's blood and all the, the disgusting things that, that the uh, um, Greeks had done there, while they were cleaning that up, it, they took eight days to clean it. And uh, they only had enough oil uh, because of the war and all that had gone on for one day, according to the legend, and yet the candles continued to burn for all eight days until they were done cleaning the temple and had it really nice. And so they consider that a miracle. And that is, uh, uh, at the end of those eight days, they have a rededication of the temple to Jehovah God. And that's why they have the menorah with the eight candles to, to signify the uh, miracle that they had uh, experienced, you know, and and, and when we go to the scriptures, we actually find Jesus um, goes to the temple and celebrates what we refer to or what they refer to as Hanukkah nowadays. And um, that's exactly what he's there uh, doing. Remember, Jesus was Jewish. And so this is uh, part of his people's history. And uh, Jesus didn't celebrate Christmas. Is that an interesting fact to know? Um, he never celebrated Christmas. That's not, he wasn't um, a Christian. <laughs> he was a Jew, and uh, that's just a fact, and so Jesus, um, <clears throat> Christmas wasn't uh, come up with, um, I guess, uh, or Jesus wasn't come up for, for Christmas. Christmas was made up for Jesus because of who he is and, and what he had done, and so, um, but Jesus did. He celebrated Hanukkah, and uh, they, uh, they called it in uh, John ten twenty two the Feast of Dedication, is what you'll read it called there because it was the rededication of the temple um, to the true and, and holy God. Well, we made it. I did 
I stretched it out long enough. So anyway, I hope that it was interesting to you. Like I said, I had just prepared that just for our young adults class because we had some questions about that. And so I'm sorry. Um, I felt like uh, I didn't really have a, as much Bible as I would have usually liked to have had with a big group like this in the auditorium. So I apologize about that. But I hope that it was interesting. And, and uh, as we said Sunday, you know, I hope that you can take some of these ideas and some of these things and use them. Go teach. Go teach someone because that's really what we're called to do is to teach other people about Jesus. And and if any of this information helps in reaching to someone, then it's worth it. It's worth knowing it, and it's worth being able to reach out to them. You know, a lot of churches um, in the past, in the churches of Christ, have studied the restoration history. And the restoration movement is a wonderful movement to study, and it's wonderful to know that there were people who, uh, who did the things that they did in, in, uh, in restoring what we find in the Scriptures. But as with this, it's not inspired history. Uh, they were people who made mistakes too, and, and uh, they weren't perfect. They were just doing the best that they could, uh, really just like we are. We're struggling along to do the best that we can to study the Bible and, and put it to practice in our life. And so I encourage you, you know, take some of the things that you learn, and, and especially maybe watching the History Channel or other uh, programs that put out information Take your Bible with you and study and, and check things according to the scriptures that we might then be able to teach and help others come to a complete knowledge of what God would have them to know. All right, well, let's have a prayer and then we'll be dismissed. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church family. Father, we pray that you would bless each person and each family that's here, uh, that you would be with our little ones, Father, and, and watch over them and keep them safe. Father, thank you so much for the blessing it is that, that we... Uh, are entrusted to teach and to help not only our little ones, but all those who we might come in contact with. And we just pray that you would give us uh, the strength and the knowledge and the ability and the willingness to say uh, the name of Jesus and to teach others uh, about your way and what you would have them to do, Father. Help us to uh, instruct according to the scriptures and to encourage according to the faith that you have uh, delivered to us through the word. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have uh, in this great country to uh, talk about your son and to, to, sharely, uh, to freely share his name and to freely uh, go about and, and try to help others as they grow closer to you in their faith, Father. And we just pray that you help us, that each one of us, uh, that our faith would grow and that we would be stronger tomorrow than we were today, Father. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.